Hello, I'm Elaine Birchall, a registered social worker with a specialty in treating hoarding behavior and helping people declutter their homes and their lives. If you've chosen this video, it's probably because there's someone in your life that you're concerned about with respect to their hoarding behavior. I'd like to reassure you that it is possible people do recover from hoarding, but it takes a tremendous amount of commitment, patience, perseverance, and support from very skilled hoarding informed professionals. In preparation for this video, I polled clients and their family and asked them before that first call to me, what did they most feel they needed to know? And I've prepared um, some information and some resources to reflect what their needs were. I've received a tremendous number of emails, phone calls, um, and contact uh, and contacts through the Contact Us uh, segment of my website, www.hoarding.ca. I've received contacts from as far away as Hong Kong, Japan, Moscow, Helsinki, the British Isles, all across Canada and the United States, and Brazil. Um, and so this information um, is designed to reassure and give people that first piece of information they need to get started, started helping their loved one. These were the things that my clients and their family members told me they most needed. First, they needed reassurance as to whether recovery from hoarding behavior was even possible. They needed a reality check, some way of figuring out how at risk their family member and loved one was, or really and truly how bad that hoarding situation was that they were looking at. They needed ideas on how to approach the person and open up dialogue and communication rather than further um, alienate the person and close down communication and make intervention and support impossible. They needed to know what not to do. They needed ideas on resources that have worked for others in the past. And they needed a checklist to determine what risk both the person living in the hoarding situation, those living in close, close proximity, neighbors, um, pets, were also living uh, with. First of all, I'd like to offer a little bit of background information so that we can put some context and background to what we're going to discuss a little later in, the ho in this video. We'll start with the definition of hoarding. Not all messy situations are hoarding. Hoarding has three essential components. First, there must be an excessive accumulation and a failure to discard. I like to say proportionately. Many people believe that hoarders can't discard anything. That's simply not true. What they don't do, in all cases, is keep up with the discarding end of things compared to the accumulation um, side of the equation. Some or all of the living spaces, and that includes cars, garages, yards, attics, basements, can't be used for their intended purpose. Any or all. And that has continued to the point where there's distress or impairment in being able to do the day-to-day -day activities that we all need to do to live. Cook, bathe, um, prepare food, um, use the bath, um, exit and enter the home. And that uh, has started to cause distress either for the person themselves or for others. Now those others could be neighbors, could be the fire department, could be public health, bylaw, property standards, animal control, uh, neighbors, friends, who if they knew the truth would have cause to be concerned. So all of those three essential components for hoarding, uh, the definition of hoarding, need to exist to some degree um, for it to be a hoarding situation. The other thing I'd like to tell you is that there are two absolute essentials for long-term success. The first is you must help that person get help, usually counseling for the underlying reasons why they're hoarding. Otherwise, the hoarding behavior will continue.
The second thing you absolutely must do is the property, of the accommodation must be cleaned up. And the condition of the property is a direct byproduct of the untreated behavior and the extent to which that person is living with distorted beliefs. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the types of hoarding behavior. There are three types of hoarding um, situations. One is common hoarding, the second is called Diogenes syndrome, and the third is animal hoarding. Let's back up to common hoarding. Common hoarding has two subtypes. Now, um, with common hoarding, we have generalists. Those are the situations that many of you will have seen on hoarders or hoarding buried alive. They're usually high amounts um, of materials, uh, stored chaotically. They usually involve uh, some degree of um, other life forces uh, living secretly beneath them, mice, rats, infestation of cockroaches. Um, and they do go on to become health and safety hazards. The second subtype in common hoarding is called specialists. Specialists are attracted by one or more specific category of items. Those items have high value for them and a high, high attraction value. What is true in all hoarding situations is that hoarders don't wake up one day on their own and say, gee, I think I have enough. So untreated hoarding behavior will go on given enough time to create chaos and a lack of safety in the person's life. Safety from fire hazard, safety from health hazard. The second type of hoarding behavior that I spoke about a moment ago is Diogenes syndrome. It isn't restricted to senior citizens, but generally we find it in our senior population, usually because at that time in a person's life, they're assessed for social programs. Certainly that's true in Canada and many other countries. And so through that assessment process, the discovery is made that these individuals are living in abject, unbelievable squalor. Um, it's unimaginable, the filth um, that, that, and the contamination and the risk that people are at. I've I have worked with individuals who are living um, secretly, who have lived secretly with Diogenes syndrome and been discovered. Um, and we have had to chip um, cans and bottles of food that the person was still willing to ingest off of shelves that predated, they dated back 20 and 30 years. Um, so people are at significant risk living in, in, with Diogenes syndrome. The third type of hoarding behavior is animal hoarding. And in all cases of actual animal hoarding or hoarding with animal involvement, your local SBCA or Humane Society must be called. If you discover a hoarding situation or you're calling as, as a result of a hoarding situation that you know of and children are involved in that, you really need to call your local children's services and children's aid society. Um, individuals who hoard um, engage in some very problematic thinking styles and have over many years usually developed distorted beliefs and other people's lives are ruined and severely affected by them. Children who are forced to grow up um, in hoarding situations and even pets, um, their lives are shortened and the quality of their life is negatively impacted. So if you must, please make the calls you need to make in extreme hoarding situations. The prevalence of hoarding, hoarding is not an uncommon behavior. Um, it exists at conservative levels, 1 to 2 percent of the general population. So in uh, my area, for instance, Ottawa, with a population of 900,000, you're looking at somewhere in the vicinity of in excess of 13,000 common hoarding situations. You're probably looking at in excess of 700 animal hoarding situations and uh, probably closing in on 500 uh, Diogenes uh, syndrome situations. Those are high numbers. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, what are the 10 most common things to hoard. Um, that was information um, that um, my clients wanted to know as well. Paper is at the top of the list. Paper is very, very difficult to manage, even for individuals who don't have hoarding behavior. The amount of unsolicited paper material that comes into our lives every week is huge, um, especially newspaper. Things that you and I would use in our everyday life, um, those things are hoarded as well by, by individuals with this syndrome. Um, excessive recycling materials, unfortunately the materials never get recycled. Plastic bags, clothing, sentimental things that remind individuals of better times. Wool, fabric, craft supplies, furniture, and animals. One of the most uh, common questions I've been asked is how to start opening up the dialogue with someone who's been resistant to talking um, about their hoarding behavior or perhaps is in denial. Um, there is nothing like the truth, okay? Speak truthfully about how much you love that person, how much you care about them and are concerned about them. Be specific. Say things like, when I see this, that concerns me. The number of these things um, that have deteriorated, the condition, the specific condition that the person is living in, uh, the fact that perhaps there's very little uh, space to prepare food, that food is not being kept in a sanitary, um, healthy manner, um, that garbage is lying out and that it's becoming um, a source of attraction for mice. Um, mouse scat is very dangerous. Another thing people wanted to know um, was, are there things that they shouldn't do? What are the don'ts um, about beginning that dialogue? And so I've put together a list of things to uh, just keep in mind. Um, the first is, unless the property, the home, the yard, represents a significant health and safety risk, um, don't zero in on the accumulation, on the things, on the number of things, on the way they're stored. Start talking to the person about how they feel and how things got to this point and listen. They will tell you everything you need to know. Use their terms. If they use the word collection, you use the word collection. You may think they're hoarders, but if they think they're collectors, you need to start with where they're at if you want to lead them to where you believe they need to be. Don't label the problem. It's about changing the person's beliefs and their attitudes and their relationship to their things, not simply discarding. If that relationship doesn't change, then the person can discard any number of things and they'll simply replace them because they haven't let them go. Don't confront denial until you've reestablished a solid relationship and you know that you're in a position to be trusted to say things that might be hard to hear. Don't blame anyone. Hoarding behavior is a little like type 1 diabetes. No one is at fault. And a person who hoards is never not going to be a hoarder. What they will learn to do is to manage it and to monitor themselves using skills and techniques, strategies that they don't have right now, but they're perfectly capable of learning if they want to. Don't ask rapid-fire questions. It's not unusual. It's normal when you discover a hoarding situation. To you yourself, be anxious or overwhelmed um, and to speak quickly and to ask a lot of questions and to express your concern. You need to contain that. You need to breathe deeply. Don't ask more than one or two questions in a row and let the person answer. Be very careful of the language you use. Language is powerful. So it's a good idea to practice what you're going to say um, so that you don't inadvertently um, come across judging the person. And don't let yourself be cast as rescuer. 
the person themselves must um, be respected and supported to remain in control of the choices and the pace that they will work at. That is the only way that they are going to be successful in those two essential components of successful long-term um, outcomes. Remember, getting them help for the underlying reasons that they hoard Secondly, supporting them to clean up and declutter the property. That property is the, uh, is the byproduct of the untreated behavior. Let me talk to you a little bit more about some of the other resources. Um, on my website, I put together this Hoarding Resources March 2009 document. Um, and I'd like to refer you to a few of the books. In particular, anything written by Dr. Randy Frost or Dr. Gail Steckety or Dr. Gary Patronick on the subject of animal hoarding is best source information. There are other um, good sources as well, but anything written by them you can count on. Secondly, um, Loving Someone with OCD um, is a great book. It's good for you as the individual who's involved with the person who's hoarding with an underlying um, disorder of, of obsessive compulsive disorder or obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Um, it's also a really good book for the person living with OCD, um, being able to appreciate the other parts of themselves and love themselves, come to love themselves, faults and all. Another book I'd like to draw your attention to that I've loaned to a client so I can't show you today is Overcoming Compulsive Hoarding, Why You Save and How You Can Stop. It's number five on the book list on my website. Um, and I've been told by my clients and by their family that it's an easy read, it makes sense, and it really helps people to identify the ways in which even if they don't want to admit it, they may suffer from aspects of hoarding behavior. Um, procrastination, why you do it and what to do about it now is a really good book to help individuals who just can't keep at it. You don't ever cross the finish line if you stop midway. It's written by Jane Burke and Lenora Ewan, and I really recommend it as well. Some of the other books, Dr. Frost, uh, Randy Frost and Dr. Gail Steckety have, um, have designed this Compulsive Hoarding and Acquiring Workbook. It's a really good book for individuals to use as they work through different stages in their progress. And because hoarding situations um, are expensive, it, it's not cheap to be a hoarder, um, even individuals who have high levels of income, it's not uncommon for their finances to be in just a greater state um, of chaos as their home and their things. And so Gail Vaz Oxalade's Debt Free Forever is a book that I recommend and lend out to my clients all the time. If you look at the hoarding resources, you'll notice um, a box about three quarters of the way down the page. Um, all of the little pamphlets and manuals below that are written by Sandra Felton. Um, she's another great source of credible information and I've been told by many of my clients who have purchased these very inexpensive um, uh, support manuals that they were really easy to understand, really easy to use, and very easy to relate to. There are audio tapes. There are peer support uh, groups online. I would ask you, though, to use um, discretion and to use, you know, buyer beware um, when participating in an online support group. If you find that it's not um, moving you forward, perhaps your time and energy uh, might be better uh, spent in trying to find um, a support group, a face-to-face -face facilitator-led support group, or getting counseling. Okay. I've put together um, some uh, questions as well, questions about acquiring, um, questions about discarding. And the other thing I'd like to do is read you this section on questions about how to organize and let go. Um, you start with one area 
and you spend as many future sessions working through that area until it's completed. Don't use the Swiss cheese method, which is reach in and grab one thing, reach in and grab another. It, that does not create that sense of accomplishment and progress that somebody really so badly needs in order to persist. Um, and on judging risk, that was another thing that my clients um, and their family wanted to know. How do we assess the risk um, that what we're seeing actually represents? How bad? How do we know how bad this situation really is? Um, so if entrances, exits, or areas near heat and ignition sources, for example, furnaces, stoves, portable heaters, baseboard heaters, water heaters, or uncovered light bulbs are in a cluttered state. So a good rule of thumb is that paths leading to and from all um, your front door, your back door, and any entrance to any room, as well as through the home, should be at a minimum three to four feet wide, and the accumulation should not be higher than below the shoulder. Um, that's not to say that that's ideal, but that's an absolute minimum. And under no circumstances should any, any heat source um, or open flame, pilot lights on water heaters, pilot lights on furnaces, baseboard heaters, um, have any manner of accumulation around it, even if the materials aren't combustible. They absorb the heat and they pass that on. They cause the materials in closer proximity to them to deteriorate and sooner or later perhaps to ignite. Um, the use of extension cords is also uh, very questionable. The excessive use of extension cords, particularly where there's an accumulation piled on the floor is really a bad practice. The, um, the risk is that individuals begin to use extension cords to circumvent their electrical panels so they don't have enough plugs um, in any of their rooms. And these extension cords are a hazard in two ways. First of all, they're a tremendous tripping hazard. And secondly, um, it's also not unusual that you know visitors accumulate under uh, materials, mice, cockroaches, rats, and in particular, um, they're very attracted to electrical uh, cords and chew them, um, or the cords themselves deteriorate um, and cause ignition. This happens all the time. This is not an exaggerated risk. This is a very real risk. At your absolute earliest possible opportunity, check that smoke detectors and if they're in place, uh, carbon monoxide detectors are operational. Do the person a favor and change the battery whether it seems to need it or not. You don't know how old that battery is that's in there. Uh, they must be functioning to give the person half a chance to get out in case of a fire or smoke emergency. Um, some of the other things I'd like to talk to you a little bit about are um, what to do um, if you discover a hoarding situation and after listening to this material, this information, you determine that actually it is a very, very high risk. Um, and you can't on that first visit remedy that risk. Um, it's so extreme. It's very hard to do, I know but it has made the difference in, in both getting change behavior um, and movement and saved lives. You need to make the call you need to make. If the, the risk um, is a fire hazard, then you really need to trust um, and call your local fire inspection branch. Let them come and do an assessment. They won't call something an emergency that isn't. And generally what happens is that where at all possible, they give the homeowner every opportunity um, by setting recommendations with deadlines. In my experience, and this is the truth, sometimes that has been the only thing that started uh, making the individual 
take the matter seriously and make even the preliminary changes that might have saved their lives and the lives of anyone living um, in close proximity to them, including their pets. If it's public health or property standards, um, make those calls. I, I would like to highlight, though, that the three to four foot rule for paths through a home to entrances and, and egress routes um, to the entrance to each room, those are guidelines. Actually, you need to call your local fire department and ask them what in your jurisdiction the minimum standards are because they do vary according to jurisdiction. So my um, my telling you about the three to four foot rule is simply a guideline. So um, I'd like to thank you for your interest um, in helping your family member. Uh, you may make the difference um, in the quality of their life or the safety of their life. And I'd like you also, despite the fact that what you may have to do um, is very difficult personally for you, um, I want you to know how lucky your family member is to have you in their life concerned enough to want more information. I hope this information has been helpful. If you feel you would like more help, I'd be happy to help you. I do distance counseling um, and distance consulting where uh, hoarding informed specialists aren't available to the individual in their, in their community, and I'd be happy to assist in any way I can. You can reach me through contact us at www.hoarding.ca or by calling me at 492-0700 area code 613. Good luck. Better days ahead.